Hello and welcome to That's Over Everything Podcast. This is a podcast where we receive stories, tips, and tactics from entrepreneurs who have done it. Today, we have Matthew Holman on the podcast. He has growth up at QPallet, and today we're going to talk subscriptions. But first, my guy Owen, what's good with you, bro? How are you? Alex Witter, we're back at it again, again, and again. Uh, things are going great with me, bro. You know, um, this past weekend had a relaxing weekend up in Muskoka. You know what I'm saying? The annual Tobin Classic. Shout out to my guy, Colin, celebrating his birthday. Bro, you need to head to Muskoka one of these days, man, just to do like a, a trip. The amount of um, nature that's out there, like not amount, but just the level of nature that you get, the peace, the the serenity you get, um, it's just out of this world, bro. Like, so I was out there with the guys and a couple girls. Like, you know, we always celebrate. And we had this theme. Like, it's got it's a Apra ski theme. You know what that is? That, I mean, that is. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So whatever it is, um, you just show up dressed like as a ski person. So I had to like go to Kensington Market, grab a little coat. And uh, make sure I'm in the theme. But, man, I had a blast. We played an amazing um, round of golf on Saturday. I had my best round so far of the year. Um, shot over, like, five over par, which is not too bad. Um, it's, like, five strokes over par. I know you're not a golfer and everything, so this might be, like, something that, you know, I need to explain to you after. But that's, like, a decent score in golf. But, man, overall, I had a great time. Um, I always feel refreshed coming back from uh, Muskoka, bro. There's something about it, like just like the level of, you know, like especially like when his place is in the woods, you see the water, you see the whole lake, you see Lake Rosso, you see like boats, and you're like traveling from a boat from his his cottage to like the parking lot where you park the car. So you can't even drive to the crib and just park right there. You have to take a boat. So he has to come pick us up. So even on that boat, you're just enjoying the whole scenery. Like, man, there's, like, ballers who live on that joint. Um, Kevin O'Leary's cottage is just, like, right around the corner. Um, the guy who owns uh, Smart Centers, you know Smart Centers, like, where they build Walmart? Mm-hmm. Uh, Mitchell Mitchell Goldhart, he has a cottage, like, right then and there. Um, man, and just, like, the, the who's who's, like, take helicopters to Muskoka, like, every single weekend. They don't even drive there. So just seeing, like, their 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 properties and seeing how that they, they had their boats parked out was just like so dope to see and i've seen this before but just like as another reminder i'm like man it's like a different life out here man so i came back for fresh sunday had a great time and um you know just ready to get back at it man that's I'm glad with you bro that's dope man uh it's dope to, to get some refreshing time to you know spend by yourself and not spending some of the people you care about you know spending with your friends so mm-hmm. that's dope for you man you know, um, so shout out to yeah. the shout out to the boys. Shout shout to Colin, man. Shout out to Colin Crawford. Most definitely on my end, bro. I uh, want to see uh, Woman King. You know, Woman um, King. Yes, yes, yes. I went to see Woman King um, yesterday, so that was dope. Um, Is that with um, Search and Trophy, bro? With um, Viola Davis. Viola Davis. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, Viola Davis. Um, and it was it was an interesting movie. It was different. You know, you had to put on your blinders because like they had a lot of different African actors in there, and they're mm. all giving their own like country's accent in the movie. Um, mm. but once you like put your blinders onto that, it's a pretty good movie. You know, mm. um, so, so it was very it, interesting. Is Viola Davis like the king in the movie? No, she's she's working way up to king. In the movie, she's working you know? way she's up a, to she's king. A, she's, she's a general in the movie. She's general, uh, you know what I'm saying? Um, you know, that man. that doesn't sit well with me, bro. Like, Why not? a woman king, you know what I'm saying? Like, if I was a woman, uh, why do I want to, like, be, like, even if I hold the highest state, like, the highest position in, in the royal rankings, which is, like, a queen, why would I rather be, like, a king? You know, she's, not, she, she's actually not king. Um, there was a king in the movie. John Boyega plays the king in the movie. So she wasn't actually king. What she was was a general, right? And she was just a leader. So a king was just like a play on words um, in terms of who who she she was, in terms of her respect. She was like a king in terms of how people were respecting her because she was a general, you know what I'm saying? Mm. Um, and after John Boyega, like, you know, crowns her, like, like a, I, don't, I don't know if it was Women King, but something like of that nature where she's like right next to him in terms of, 
leadership in the in the kingdom, you know. So so that's kind of what it was. And it was like a a, a spin off of the um the tribes that were uh taking is it shape Wakanda? Y- years ago. No, 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 it's not Wakanda, bro. Wakanda is is, is Avengers. What well, Avengers, bro? It's not Avengers. Wakanda is its own different thing, bro. No, Wakanda is in the Marvel universe. Is what I'm saying. You know what I'm uh, saying? Wakanda. Okay, it's, not, okay. it's not. It's not. It's not. It's based in, in in reality. It has nothing to do with with um, the Marvel universe. You know, it's it's um its own thing. Um, and it's it's based off of like a off a real life tribe that, that had like all women in it. Um. So yeah, it was interesting. It was an interesting movie to see. Um, and they all had like vow to like not have kids and just like focus on, um, you know, being soldiers. It was a really different, you know, like, different perspective to see. Sounds uh, sounds I, very modern, bro. Like the way the way you just described it. Um, nah, actually, it's not. It's not it's even very, modern. Nah, I wouldn't say it's modern I mean, at all. It, it, you know, come on. I mean, it echoes a little bit of of the the realities we live in, don't you think? No, yeah, I would say there definitely is. There's definitely like same synonymous strings, you know, mm-hmm. from you know how a lot of women want to be equal and stuff like that. But I don't think any woman is trying to be <laughs> in Viola Davis's space. You know what I'm saying in terms <laughs> of like what they're actually doing, being actual like soldiers killing people and stuff like that. Nah, I don't think. Like it takes it another le- to another level where it's like not even, you know, realistic. You know, so yeah. It, yeah that's it, what it's, I was going with it. I was like, man, if like if I'm like being known as woman king, I- I'd find that like, you know, it wouldn't sit right with me. You know, like the and I kind of find like these movies kind of have like the nuance, the, this the hidden message, the hidden messaging, um, and you know the the image they're trying to perpetuate a little bit. And, you know, from what what I'm hearing, I'm just like, man, this sounds like very similar to like what we're like always discussing and like what's part of discourse these days. So I got to check it out and actually form like an actual opinion on it. But just from the bits I'm hearing, it sounds uh, something that, you know, I definitely have a lot of thoughts on it. Yeah, it's nothing like what we're actually discussing. You know, there is they're, they're serving a king and they're all like fighting for the king, you know, so it's. It's not like they're independent on their own and and just becoming you know kings of the of the, the land themselves instead of being a queen. It's actually about serving um, John Boyega's character, the the king, and um, the real like issue between it is actually uh, um, this, like discussing selling slaves because their tribe years ago was was actually the ones that were selling um, their people to the Europeans and and Americans, you know. So and they were like discussing like how to get around it, things of that nature. So, yeah, that that's what it's more so about instead of just like being, um, you know, soldiers. But there is there was like a whole training camp for these women. It was different, bro. It was a whole different perspective that that uh, I've never seen on film before. And that's actually what inspires Avengers. Like you know the um in Avengers in in um Wakanda Forever that's gonna come out and in. Black Panther, there was, like, these woman fighters. Um, like, there was, like, the, they had bald heads and they had, like, the spears and the red outfits. That was inspired off of them. You know, mm-hmm. they took, like, like, different notes from them and, like, from their weapons and things of that nature. So that was interesting. You know what I'm saying? So you actually um, saw this? You actually saw this in theaters? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Word. Nice, bro. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, but, yo, let's get into the business tip of the week. You know what I'm saying? Uh, yeah, man, what do you got for us, bro? Bestow that knowledge on us. Uh, that's going to be transformative <laughs> for our business, bro. Most definitely. So this week, um, we are talking about the top five Chrome extensions to help you have a more productive. Um, I just took took some quick notes, things that I found extremely easy. So I have about five apps for you, five Chrome extensions that you can use to make your life easier as you run your business so number one is color picker color picker is a easy way for you to um pick colors online so one of the things that i find a lot of times you'll see a color on someone's story or someone's um website and you go, what color is that and you want to like uh, steal that um, you can do that with color picker it's a chrome extension that you can just find in the, in the chrome store 
Um, that one is, has been a gem, especially for working with a brand and they see a color that, you know, it represents them, but you, you don't know the exact tone of it. You can just hover over it um, and press the Chrome extension and it'll copy it into your clipboard and then you can paste the actual color code wherever you're using, if you're using it on Canva or wherever you're using it. So that's a big one. The next is font picker. Same exact thing, but just with fonts. You can highlight a font, um, right click it and hit font picker and see what font it is. So you can use that in any of your branding. That one's a big gem. I feel like a lot of people that are creatives would love that. Um, next is a classic. Um, it's, it's, it's scribe how. So scribe how is basically Vidyard, but with specific steps to um, give instructions. And this one's going to be one I'm going to be using going forward because one thing that's big is being able to do something once, get the instructions off that down, and be able to send it to people so they can take the instructions down yourself, right? So Scribe How does that. So it allows you to work with teams virtually to be able to send instructions and different information out. So that's a big gem. Next is keywords everywhere. So we're almost done now. Uh, keywords everywhere is an SEO tool it's so useful you know keywords everywhere is basically a seo tool that allows you to see what what uh um terms are ranking on uh, the google page and it shows you the level of competition on that word as well or phrase or long-term keyword um that you're looking for so keywords everywhere is a big gem if you're looking to have um your pages be more seo friendly i highly suggest keywords everywhere Lastly is a classic Vidyard, you know what I'm saying? Um, Vidyard is a great Chrome extension. Go ahead. Shout out to my old stomping grounds, bro. I used to, I used to, I used to work at Vidyard, everybody. And I used to be the partner, strategic partnerships manager at Vidyard. And I spoke so much about video, like every day, bro, that I became so apathetic about it. Like, I was just like, man, bun this, <laughs> you know, because the thing about Vidyard is it's such a simple, simple product, but there's so much you can actually sell on it because, you know, like other complex like solutions and in, in uh, for example, like where I used to work in Alita before, where it's like more of an insights platform, it's more robust, right? You can do a lot of add-ons, you can do this, you can mold it to the organization size, but Vidyard was just so simple. Like even at an enterprise level, okay, it licenses, you integrate it, boom, that's it, right? So there's nothing really switching up every time, but I definitely highly encourage everyone to use Vidyard. Amazing product. Hold on, we got to tell them what Vidyard does. You know what I'm saying? Like, like let them know, let them know. You, you, you know this people better than I do. Oh, of course, of course. Aha, okay, all right, all right. All right, so everyone, so like to, you know, to, um, complete the last uh, five tools you can use in the Chrome extension. Vidyard is an amazing product. What it is, it's an asynchronous video tool. So when you talk about asynchronous video, that means it's a closed loop video. Like for example, Alex and I are on a live call right now, that is synchronous video. So asynchronous is something that has a closed loop. So this is perfect if you're looking to send an email to someone who you're looking to get their attention, if you wanna be more intentional with your messaging, and this is perfect if you're a salesperson, if you're looking to create an impression on the person you're looking to get in contact with, they, they're they getting probably like hundreds of emails a day from like sales reps. So the best thing you can do is add video to your product, to your, to your messaging. It's also good for internal use. If you wanna use it for um, sharing your ideas, if you can screen record, uh, explain everything you're explaining instead of like writing a massive text about it and, and letting your recipient, you know, use their imagination to really understand what you're talking about this is a perfect tool for it. And there's many other use cases you can use. If you're running a sales team, you can use it for quick um, summary of thoughts of how things are going. And um, yeah, just use it just to communicate um, efficiently because when we talk, we use our expressions, we use our voice, we use our uh, body language. And in a technological sense, that's stripped away from us because we're behind the screen. So this is the best way to do it. You can send 10 minute videos, 20 minute videos, up to an hour, uh, depending on what package you have. Um, you know, Vidyard, you know, I need a cut for this. The amount of money you guys paid me, like that was good, but I'm still promoting. A competitor of them is Loom, just so it's not, you know, it's not sponsored. Um, but one thing I like about Vidyard, to be fair, um, is that once you record the video, it automatically saves to your clipboard. So you can just copy and paste it 
into your um, vid email and that'll have its own thumbnail with it. That's what I find easy about the Chrome extension. You know what I'm saying? Um, you can also have it on top of your email so you can cr easily just hit it while you're in the email. Um, so that's another thing that's amazing about Vidyard. But I believe that wraps up the um, business tips. So number one was color picker. Number two, font picker. Number three, scribe how. Number four, keywords everywhere. And number five, Vidyard. That wraps up the business tip of the week. My guy, Hustle Nation, what you got for us, bro? All right, everyone, it's Mr. Hustle Muscle on the mic, ready to give you the Hustle Nation tip of the week. And that tip of the week is actually, it's very simple. It's setting goals, but I want to take it a step further. You know, we hear this common um, thing all the time, set goals, set goals, set goals. You know, I've been a victim of this for the past, like, I don't know how many years, I'd say 15 years um, since I was like a little kid getting into high school. And... You know, the thing that we're told to set goals is like, you know, you write down your goals in your notebook and, you know, you maybe you have a month goal, you have like a six or 12 month. And then to take it a step further, you can actually have like a long term vision, like three to five year goal. But the one struggle that I've noticed and I've noticed a lot of people having is like you write down your goals and then you never look at them again. Right. So you get juiced up for maybe two, three weeks. that Oh, man, I got this goal that I got to achieve. It may be like uh, it could be health, it could be career, it could be financial, whatever it is. And the thing is, but when you set goals, it's like a lot of things happen in your life where you tend to forget your goals because other start other other things start taking precedence over those goals being accomplished. If it's maybe the gym, uh, you're like, ah, you know, I'm gonna go next this time. If it's like saving money, it's like, okay, man, I'm gonna spend some money you're going out right but your whole goal was to limit down your spending because you're trying to save for something else a lot of things happen and you find yourself getting into old habits so one of the things that you can do as a step towards this is to keep your goals top of mind so when we talk talking about top of mind like what are we uh, talking about here this is finding a way to constantly review your goals it could be either daily or weekly so for example if you wrote down your goals on a on your iPhone notepad or if you on your on your Android notes, a simple way to do this is, you know, have this photo in the home screen of your phone. So meaning when you're always scrolling on your phone, that vision or that that writing is right then and there. You can always read it and remind yourself like, OK, I got to stay this. I got to I got to keep saving for this. I got to keep eating like this. So your goals are not going in the background. If you're writing your goals in a notebook, it's perhaps taking that piece of paper and using your um, pin and pinning it on your wall somewhere and actually reviewing them every single time. These are simple ways you can start looking at your goals and actually keeping them top of mind. So that's one thing is keeping the top of mind. Now we got to take it a step further. So when you think about a goal, it's more of a end towards something. It's a, it's a destination. We're talking about three months here or oh, three months is going to be like this. So, for example, we've spoken about Alex's, Alex's and I competition that we have for December, um, you know, getting six pack abs, uh, that surf and turf. It's looking like it's coming my way. I, I, I got to tell you that it's coming my way. I don't know. What, I know you're putting in work, but December 1st is is judgment day. But something like that, Alex and I, this competition, and we know we got to be on point by December 1st. So. I know my goal is to be 185, 12% uh, body fat, and I've lost like 10 pounds over the past uh, month and a half, a month and a month and a week from where I was at at uh, 209. So what I'm getting at here is setting behaviors for your goals, because when you look at a goal, it's one thing. OK, I got to accomplish this goal. I got to accomplish this goal. But that's the end of it. But what are the things that you're doing in the middle of that to really allow you to accomplish those goals? So you can set certain behaviors such as I got to track my food and my macros. Like what am I eating? How many calories am I eating? And am I below my calories to really allow myself to achieve that goal? So this is the habit I've started to do each and every single day. And by doing this every single day, it can actually allow me to slowly get towards my goal. If it's like a business that you're looking to do or if it's um, uh, a revenue target, what are the revenue generating activities that you're doing in your day to towards getting that? It's like how many 
uh, emails have you sent? How many uh, prospects are you going towards each and every single day to really uh, up, to really get towards like your business goal? These are the certain things that you need to do, like the certain activities and like what they're going to be working towards uh, in accomplishing your goal. And these are the certain behaviors that you need to have to actually see that goal become reality. So number one here is keep those goals top of mind, have them in a place that's visible, perhaps sticking them on your wall or using your phone to constantly review them. Number two is set the behaviors. It's one thing to define the goal, but like, what are you doing each and every single day and, uh, and in, in acting towards actually achieving those goals? You can do this in fitness. You can do this in business. In fitness is tracking your food, making sure you're drinking this amount of water, 30 minutes of exercise, and just keep it very simple. Don't overwhelm yourself trying to accomplish these things. And even if it's in business, if it's a revenue target, what are the revenue gener generating activities that you're doing each and every single day and how are you tracking those on a, on a micro scale that's going to lead towards the end? So that's the Hustle Nation tip of the week. You know, we all know if you've been listening to this podcast, you know, we're very goal oriented. We know we're very motivational, but let's get in the deeper nuances there and actually dissect it like what it's going to take to get there. You know, I wish you all a very successful week. This is an amazing episode with Matthew Holman. If you're looking to start a subscription business, he drops a lot of gems in this. And, um, you know, subscriptions are the future. You know, we got to automate the way we earn money. And uh, he definitely breaks down the way to do that. So, Alex. Sign them off, man. Most definitely. I love how you use the Hustle Nation to talk <laughs> shit. You know what I'm that's saying? How I'm that, that's how you feel? Wow. All right. All right. All right. All right. Cool. Y'all see this. Let, 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 as a, uh, it's, it's documented that he's ta continuously talking, posturing. talking shit. All right. With that being said, yes, yes, yes. With that being said, ladies and gentlemen, that wraps up the Hustle Nation. That wraps up the intro. Let's get to the podcast with Matthew Holman. We'll see you on the other side. Peace. Hello and welcome to Thus Over Everything Podcast. It's the podcast where we receive stories, tips, and tactics from entrepreneurs who have done it. I'm Alex. And I'm Owen Osinde. And today we have a, a real cool guest to come in a building to speak about subscriptions. You know, um, subscriptions is something that a lot of us look to build, specifically product subscriptions. So I'm really interested to, to dive deeper in this and provide you guys with value when it comes to building a product subscription business. So today we have Matthew Holman, who leads growth up at Q Pilot. Matthew, would you mind giving the people a quick one minute summation of what you do and who you are? Yeah, absolutely. So I run growth and marketing at Q Pilot. So I'm responsible for all our content creation. Uh, leading our growth out efforts, sales efforts to try to grow the platform. And Qpilot's all about a flexible subscription experience because when people can have flexibility control, they stick around longer. Most definitely. So to start things off, I'd love to start on a on a uh, you know a icebreaker so we can all you know talk about something we all relate to. So to start off, what are some of the worst subscriptions you've ever subscribed to, and what is the most out of the box, different subscriptions that either one of you guys have subscribed to. Because I got a weird one that I'd love to hear mm -hmm. from y'all. Well, I'll say the the weirdest one is not one I've subscribed to, but the weirdest one I've seen lately is uh, it's been all over the news. Is BMW is going to announce that they're going to charge a subscription for access to their heated seats in their cars. So you buy the car, it has the heated seat in it, but if you want the heated seat to turn on, you have to subscribe. You have to pay like that. 10, 15 bucks a month. I hate <laughs> so, that. You, so they control like the, uh, uh, the access. Heating, is it like a hydro? Yeah. You know, like, you know, here we have like Toronto Hydro, right? Like you pay monthly to get like your heating, right? So they, they're able to control every BMW's heating. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. yeah. Yep. Wow. Yeah. Probably not now because I got so much backlash, but they're trying to figure out how to monetize subscriptions. Mm. That is horrible. <laughs> I mean, honestly, they're trying to get a Tesla for for the upgrades. Is what I'm what I'm thinking. You know, like like Tesla has upgrades means something to you know try and like compete with that. Is what I'm hearing right. mentally. You know, mm -hmm. you know. Right. But that that's horrible. Time, yeah. Like that's probably the worst thing I could possibly see. Like your product comes with it, but in order to get it, you have to subscribe. Right. Horrible, well, bro. That's I've, a, paid, that's a, I've that's already paid the best you for business it. model. Yeah, exactly. It's like you especially have no a replaceable like part if something goes out. Yeah, it's no, it's it's horrible. Oh, of course. So, so, so what, what is you, the worst? 
No, I mean Matthew didn't say his worst. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, that that's the one you've you've seen. But seen. what's your worst? Seen. What's one of the experiences? I don't, I don't necessarily subscribe. I don't subscribe to a lot because I'm super like I don't like getting too far into that. So like, uh, you know, I have razor a razor subscription. I almost bought Fabletics has a like you know sh- workout short subscription, but the idea that I'm going to be getting a, like a new pair of shorts all the time just I don't know didn't want to do it so. I get I get uh, CBD for sleep, and those are my that and uh, Dollar Shave Club for my head is basically my two subscriptions. I mean, those sounds like those sound like fun subscriptions, Matt. Like, I don't know why they'll be the worst you've had, man. No, those are I, that's what I mean is if I have a I, I've never had like a horrible uh, personal subscription experience because I'm I'm actually come from the side of things where I'm actually reluctant to subscribe. I'm the guy who thinks like I'll just order it when I need it. Um, I, now I remember actually I have an Amazon subscription for some kids vitamins because they get used all the time and then I have a subscription for a hot tub we have a hot tub so I get like uh, the cleaning chemicals on schedule so I don't like doing a lot on subscription because oh no you're right I did do stitch fix once that was pretty bad stitch I, fix stitch fix is where you go through yeah you go through and you tell them uh, like your clothes like you pick out clothes and stuff like that it's pretty expensive they send you a bunch of stuff and then you just send back what you don't want to use the problem was is like the fit like I've got a like a like I'm, I'm a long torso guy and you know stuff was too short and you know not quite broad enough in the shoulders and so I ended up doing it for one month and then sent it back that was probably my worst subscription experience it didn't do it didn't last very long Man, I can imagine like the LTV for that for that business. It's less like okay, you you know what I mean. Like to have clothes being sent back all the time, like especially as a business, right. like I will not want to be in that like industry, like where your subscribers are sending things they don't like. It's like even perishables, right? It's okay, the food's done, you don't like it, right. send it back to us. I mean, that's not a fun subscription. You want something that I'm gonna love this product, I'm gonna use it, I'm gonna be an advocate for it, and. I'm going to be something, it's going to be something that I find the best descriptions of stuff that's in the background, right? Like where you don't even feel it coming out, right. but you're just exactly. experiencing the product for what it is. Um, yeah. But I mean, for me, the worst subscription I have is probably like my iCloud subscription. I pay like 14. I just had to upgrade <laughs> for, that the other day. <laughs> exactly. Yo, so it's like 14 bucks a month. And then I just got a brand new iPhone four, uh, iPhone 13 recently. So pretty much like... I have 128 gigs on my phone, but there's so much content stored up in my iCloud from like university, the videos, the photos and everything like that, where if I unleash all of that, all that, all that uh, content is going to come take up my entire phone. So that was the whole reason I got a bigger phone because I upgraded from 32 GB to 128. And now I have like, we need this space on the phone to be able to record podcasts in person. So if I like cancel that subscription, I'm like pretty much toast. I hate that. I'm the opposite. I have not subscribed to the iCloud subscription. I'm like, no, no, every time. No, and no, and no. You know, because I, I dislike being, like, they, being have to, you know, subscribe to something that it's already there. The, the, the storage is right there in your phone, basically. You know, so I'm like, why do right. I have to access more storage? That's my, think, my thought process. The same way you think about, you know, the heated seats with BMW. So I'm still saying no. I have a hard drive, external hard drive that I'm gonna go through my phone and take out all the images and put them on a hard drive just so I do not have to pay anything for iCloud. Cause I, I'm like, I give Apple enough of my money, you know what I'm saying? And yeah. now they're about to come out with subscriptions too, you know, like like not just subscriptions but ads on top of that. So you're about to pay for Apple TV and get ads on top of that. Like it's gonna be it's gonna be a lot. But my worst subscription. It, most definitely, most definitely. Um, my worst subscription, I would have to say, I like, I hate Audible. I don't use Audible at all. I found Libby to be really good um, in comparison to Audible. Um, just because it's free in comparison. And I would also say, oh, I subscribe to a coffee brand. Um, and they were trying to bombard me with like, you know, multiple purchases. And I also subscribe to a, uh, a virtual networking company. Actually, Owen, you were there when I, when I was uh, talk, talking to you about it. So in this networking company, essentially you join on and then you just like get notifi- notified to hop on the chat to talk to people all across the world, you know? And 
I canceled it and then they sent me an email saying, okay, so let's do this. That was the opening line on the cancellation email. You know what I'm saying? And I was like, what is going on? You know what I'm saying? And it's like, you haven't used the system in like X, Y, Z long. So we're going to give you this one. I'm like, listen, just cancel it. Like, it was, it was insane. So that was my worst. And I'd say my best is a new coffee brand. I'm subscribed. I've been on a mushroom binge. Um, I subscribed oh, to mushroom yeah, yeah, coffee. Yeah. You know, um, I think I might have told you about it. Um, but yeah, I'm heavy into mushroom coffee right now. So I've subscribed to a mushroom coffee brand to do, to give me products once a month. You know what I'm saying? So that's my. So you're getting like one bag, or you getting a multiple bags every month? Like, tell me what what are you getting on a monthly basis? So you? it's the first it's the first um, time I've got it. I ordered it last month. It's basically like a little like tin of this much of of like organic, uh, you know, um, mushroom coffee. But I'm also trying another coffee out just to see if it's better. Um, right. I'm all, so so I'll, I'll, I'll drop the name. It's Pure Shrooms. It's actually a Canadian brand of, of uh, you know, mushroom coffee because it helps you focus better. Uh, and I'm testing it in comparison to um, Four Sigmatic, the, the one that's super popular with Joe Rogan, and to see what makes me more productive. You know what I'm saying? So we'll see what we'll see what happens but that's one of the things that i'm personally subscribed to because i really like having intense focus i have a lot of things like on the fly i'm multitasking a lot so focus is very important to me you know but enough of that let's get into the nitty gritties of you know subscription businesses especially product subscription businesses what are some common mistakes that you consistently see businesses do when it comes to subscriptions yeah, I think one of the, the the biggest mistake that I see on a on a is well would be one of two things. One is that they're trying to invent this really really complex, incredible like process for how people can engage with the brand without. So it's this idea of like you're trying to build a Tesla when you've only sold you've only ever built a bike before, right? So so an example like with your mushroom coffee, let's say they wanted to like, you know, month one you're getting this bag and then month two it's like this different thing and then month three you're getting an even different one and we're going to send surveys and we're going to have a place where you can log in and get all this community feedback and we're going to send you all these mushroom tips. So the, they, they start offering all these things and make it really, really complicated and what happens is they have no data to back that up. They just, just some founder, just somebody who's coming up with this idea of what they think would be cool or they've seen other brands do this, right? Like a stitch fix. Like they didn't just wake up one day and come up with this really, really great, this process. They started by sending, it's, it, there's an MVP involved. So that's one of the first big mistakes that I see people see is they try to overcomplicate it. And the other one would be is that you're trying to reach for a subscription that's not there. So what I mean by that is like BMW is trying to subscribe to that nobody's going to pay for something that they think that belongs in their car. Now, the, the flip side of that is, oh, like Sirius XM radio, like I could have that beamed into my car. I might be willing to subscribe to that because I'm listening to that. I want to get access to that as, as something that's different. So, um, you know, coffee, like, so if you're thinking about like trying to take your product to a subscription, I would always caution one, are people being asked for that? Like, do you have people that are saying, hey, I'd like to get this on a subscription? Because that's a little bit of a signal from people that they're willing to buy that. Is it something that's naturally makes sense for a subscription, like coffee, supplements, pet food, things that are being consumed regularly? And then the final thing would be like, what's the simplest way I can start doing this to see what people like? And, and the reason I say that too is like, you know, you're testing for focus. So if you're getting marketed to for focus, you're trying it for focus and then you cancel because you don't think you saw a focus change, like the brand needs to know that. If you didn't buy it for focus, say you just bought it because your friend told you that it was good for focus. And then you tell them, hey, I love this product because it helps me focus. They now have, oh, wow, Alex is using this because it helps him focus. We need to go back and redesign some of our workflows here where we're messaging this and reminding them on emails, like, how's the focus going? Are you able to get more done? You know what I mean? So you're, you want, as a brand, you want data because you don't want to just start building out all these processes and trying to market these things. And you're going to miss people, basically. Got you. Got you. So, like, when we're looking at um, launching a subscription-based business, right, let's take it from day one, right? So, you have someone coming in. Yeah. They have an idea for a replenishable product, such as, let's say, spices, or um, they're looking to get, they have, like, a 
fruit subscription, right? Something that people need every single day. And, you know, we can use this example and we can go to like maybe like a software, like a Spotify or an Apple Music, but it's something from day one, you have this idea, you have the concept, concept built. Um, you know, what steps do you recommend for that entrepreneur from like the rip, like no one knows about them to start marketing this business, to start building that trust, to build that customer and, uh, you know, the whole shebang. The, the first thing is you got to decide, are you going to sell, is this a subscription only business or is this a, I'm selling these as one time or subscription. So like with the spice example, am I going to sell spices on my website that have subscription as an option or am I only selling a spice subscription? So that, that changes that as well, right? Because if you're doing the one time option, then you're going to market those and then you're going to try to catch people on the subscription or you're going to try to upsell the people that have bought more than once on a subscription. If I'm selling a subscription only business, I'm going to be marketing that a little bit differently because I'm not trying to get somebody to buy one time. I'm trying to it, the, the the threshold is going to be a little bit higher, right? Because you're not committing to one purchase, you're committing to m multiple purchases. So you want to be thinking about that, making that choice. Um, and then the other thing is just thinking about like most things within when we're talking like direct to consumer e-commerce is common friction points around subscriptions. People are often going to be worried that one, they can't cancel. So you want to like have messaging and make it really clear that if they do subscribe, it's really easy to change that, cancel that, do that your, yourself. The other thing would be people are often worried about like running out or, or uh, having too much product on hand. So like Alex getting mushroom coffee, like what happens if he only drinks half of a tin a month and now he's got two tins sitting there, right? So you want to be able to get that kind of information and or let make it easy for people to like manage how they're going to get that. But those are generally why people don't subscribe. So you want to at least try to overcome that with good messaging and product page design. And then the, the final thing would be is like, I'm again, I'm coming back to this data thing without making it too like, I don't think you need to get super complex is trying to gather reasons why people are getting on it. So you want to be talking to people like what made you want to do this and jump at this and try the subscription. And even if that's just call like when you're a small startup, you're hustling, like you got to be making those calls yourself. You got to get that data yourself. And then the other thing would be is like around cancellation. So if you can set up, you know, with Shopify, this is super easy. And, and most subscription apps are going to have some kind of add on where if somebody cancels, you don't want to make it like Alex is telling the horror story of like, you know, they're like, let's do this and trying to like make this big whole thing. It's like you want it to be real simple. Try to get like one or two data points when somebody cancels. Like, why did you cancel? what was it the product was it us or you what like let us know um because I, I think it's really hard to understand until you're doing it like you just don't know what you don't know and you don't know why people are really loving it it's rare when a brand is just like totally aligned with their customer from the gate and they they don't change mm -hmm. anything it's generally as you start on an assumption you learn you iterate you reposition a little bit you learn some more you do it again and the best subscription businesses are doing that they go with an MVP, they start to gather data, they figure something out, they make a little change, their conversions boost 20%, like their retention goes up 10%, they gather more data, right? Like you, you gotta do it on a bit by bit. Yeah, and you're, and you're right on that, man. Even like when uh, I subscribe to, um, it was like a shaving brand that I really respect, it's like uh, called Bevel. So the thing about me is it's like, I really wanted to support the brand, but I really shave often, right? I think at this stage, I was really trying to grow my beard. And the one thing that really annoyed me that I found at the time, even though I love the brand, was like how sneaky the subscription was. So, for example, <laughs> I'm at checkout, you know, and, and I've noticed a lot of different businesses do this, right? They will not really make it seem as if this is on auto ship, like where you're going to be getting it in every three, every every month or maybe bi monthly. And then next thing I know is like, you know, and. and Mind you, Matt, I'm like in university at this point, right? So every dollar to me matters. I'm working like a part time job, like, you know, living with a bunch of roommates, but I really want to like use this brand. So I'm like trying to like buy groceries, right? I hadn't checked my bank account and, you know, like groceries were like, you know, a hundred bucks and like, you know, like I'm like a broke college student at this point, right? And I just thought I bought this kit one time and my thing gets declined. I'm like, what the hell? Like, I know, like, I just paid rent, I just paid my phone bill. I definitely know I have enough funds to. To, to buy buy this a thing so i put like i go aside i check my td bank app 
and I see I got auto charged and in USD too. Like, can you take that in? In US dollar, <laughs> it's just like ninety ninety dollars with, with shipping and tariffs and everything like that. I'm like, are you kidding right, me, bro? Right. Like, and then I had this oversupply of shaving. It's the same thing, like the same cream, the same palm, another razor as well too. I'm like, come on. So funny enough, I still have two kits. So one kit, cause I, I, I stopped shaving cause I was trying to grow my beard. One kit is for my traveling. So I, I keep that in my toiletry bag. So whenever I go home from traveling, I know I have like something to shave if I need to line up. And then the other one just stays in my bathroom, man. But that's one thing I find these subscriptions doing is that they're so sneaky to get you into a repetitive customer. Yeah. And that, that I mean, that's a bad experience. And I, I like to pull out just a couple of things you said as a good example. One, the fact that you're using two kits in two different ways that's that's you're doing that as a result of a bad experience but as a brand i would be curious because you know maybe i can market to my consumers and say i sell the one kit and with replenishment but hey a lot of our guys use two because they travel and they don't want to have to swap them out all the time you know that like that might not be a core business component but that's an upsell opportunity right like mm-hmm. hey i know you only you only really need one kit however you know owen over here uses a second kit because he doesn't want to have to worry about changing out his travel bag all the time Boom, there's an interesting use case right there, right? The other thing would be is like, if you want to sell that way, I always equate that to like bad gym memberships, right? Like if you want to be a gym membership company, then fine. Just know that at the end of the day, a lot of people are going to resent you. Otherwise is, oh, hey, here's your kit. We do auto ship the replenishment stuff. And oh, yeah, hey, oh, and sorry, like you didn't need them that fast because you're, you're shaving. So, or you're growing your beard out. So why don't you put that replenishment on six months instead of one month? You know, like you can create an engagement or an experience where it actually gets personalized for you. And that way, that six month renewal is better than no renewal. Right. Mm-hmm. Like that's that's the attitude. We, we want to try to meet people where they're at and, and, and work with those people. I, I will say so that, you don't people don't feel overwhelmed by having to make this really, really complicated is. Most people, when they subscribe, are OK with the status quo. It's it's there's 10 to 20 percent of your customers maybe need something a little bit different, but that's where the profit is, right? You wanna make sure if you can make it easy for those people to stick around, your 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 subscription business is gonna be much more profitable. What are some subscription businesses you see killing it right now that you feel like I've actually got it right? Product subscription specifically. Yeah, um, I think still like one of the leaders in the space that I love that I use and they've been around from the beginning is Dollar Shave Club. Um, and there are some that are similar to them, um, Harry's, um, and there's some um, female shaving brands that are they're starting up as well. And they're kind of having this approach, which is um, they're they're having diverse product lines. So they start out selling razors, but they're going to offer start selling shaving cream and aftershave and all these other products because they're going after the whole like you know um, cosmetic space itself. But it's also about like you know if I'm shaving my head, I use you know I go through a razor a week, right? Um, maybe, but if I start shaving my face, I'm going to go through two razors a week. So my subscription changes and I've been on dollar shave club for like three or four years right now. And I do change it periodically. I, if, and if I get too many razors, I just pause it for three months and I can go in and choose to do that. I can just pause it period or I can go, no, I want the next shipment to go three months from now, something like that. So, so those ones are doing really well. I think some of the more innovative ones, like we're seeing food subscriptions, like you mentioned, like, like fresh food stuff. I think with the rise, like with COVID and everything, we're seeing um, a lot of brands getting like, you know, um, meat boxes or experiences. So there, there's a lot of really fun ones in the space, depending like I, uh, I've mentioned this one before, but I was at a subscription trade show and the, somebody that won was a, they were doing um, subscription boxes for guinea pigs. So I think that niches, yeah, yeah, yeah. Niches, Man, niches. are doing really, really well. Yeah. So you finding you're creating community. Uh, I follow a woman on TikTok who does an ADHD subscription, and it's all about stuff to help people with ADHD, whether they're planners and games and tactile things. And so I think that's really where the future is, is like not thinking like, oh, I'm going to become the next Dollar Shave Club. But really, I want to make a, a men's product line for travelers. And so every month I'm going to send a different thing from a different city or, you know, like you, you, you niche down to something really cool and you get to have fun with it. It's creative. Um, I think that's where some of the cool stuff is happening. 
yeah and even like i've noticed too like there's like a watch subscription right so like you have these watch fans right and um i i I heard this one podcast this one guy did it was like an e-commerce podcast i think shopify did it he launched like a a a subscription for watches and the way to draw interest for this watch is like he would have like a draw for a, a rolex right so he got so many subscribers like all in one time because he was able to like give someone the hope of winning a rolex so let's say i subscribe for a watch maybe 90 dollars to 100 bucks a month the chance of me winning a roly is like okay i get maybe fourteen thousand dollars worth of value when i win that rolex it totally beats like the hundred dollars i'm going to be spending every month for a new watch so he grew like his business like super quick in like three months he had close to like 800 subscribers and for a watch subscription that is huge you know what i mean right so i'm starting to see a lot of different like industries and different markets where people are forming subscriptions for anything like candle subscriptions because i'm a candle guy too you know like i like i like my house smelling nice candles are big candles candles are are huge you know so i think it's all about finding like a like a nice market where people will be like you know what i need this every single month and I think those ideas are like looking at if we're walking around our house, we can find a subscription for anything if we really make a community around it. Well, and, and think about the use. So it, like and it's, just, it's if I'm just going to sell a candle and you just want something nice smelling like it's easy to go buy a candle anywhere. Right. Like mm-hmm. it's it's easy. Sometimes the back like the background, like if I'm just having a generic like coffee, I don't care what coffee I get. I just can order something on subscription. There's a lot of competition for that. Right. We want to be thinking about that next stage from that marketing. Oh, it's candles. It's like this is a guy's candle or this is a seasonal candle. This is a you're living. You want your house to smell like this or experience the different flavors of the sense of the world. Every month you're going to get a scent from somewhere else. And that way, you know what I mean? We're thinking about experience and why somebody would actually be interested in getting that. Every month I'm going to get something a little bit different. I do like having my home smelling nice. So you want to be thinking about customer experience and that extra reason why somebody's going to buy because that makes the selling and the marketing that much easier. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, I was do, I, in doing research for this, niching down was one of the, the top things that I saw uh, mm-hmm. as one of the main reasons to create a subscription business. But now speaking of that, you know, one thing that I saw that was very troubling to me was that Bark's numbers are insanely low right now. Like bark Which, box, bark box, yeah, bark box. Like, yeah, yeah. They're they're going through it. Like to to give you some numbers, they have they're reporting a fifteen point four million dollar net loss uh, right. last year. You know, which is negative thirty eight percent year over year. You know, and this is like a consistent thing that's happening in the in the D to C market. Have you have you been seeing this on your end, Matthew? Yeah, absolutely. Well, and I mentioned Stitch, Stitch Fix earlier. Is that same thing? They were in the news the other day yeah. like, that they're really struggling to sustain their business model. Well, well, BarkBox is going up against a ton of start like the pet food space, the pet supplement food uh, toy space is just booming. But uh-huh. you're having competitors pop up all over the place, but they're all coming at it from a different angle, right? Like I make whole natural foods. We make them in our own farm or this is a toy experience. You're going to get a different type of toy to engage with your, your, your animal every month. Or some brands are doing like, you know, selling CBD supplements and things like that as well for pets. So there's a ton of competition there. And some of the big, big brands are getting, I think, are seeing a lot of subscription fatigue from people in general but the space overall is growing like the mm-hmm. product subscriptions are i think are looking at like they're they were at like 50 or 60 billion like last year and they're projected to be at like 250 billion in another five years so it's it's booming big time yeah and and that's another great great point matthew is like if you're looking at maybe at a candle subscription is like if i decide to start like a candle subscription business the threat that exists of maybe like a Bath and Body Works just coming in that space because they have the supply chain, they have the brand, they have everything. So it's like, okay, how do I take a subscription-based business when there's always this threat of like a giant like Bath and Body Works or like a Pet Mart yeah, but starting I, a subscription? Say, you know, and- like how do you personalize your business to be like, okay, I can keep my customer over time when I don't have this like vertically integrated business, which can just come and like step on me at any time. 
Yeah, but let's say like like again, like the hustle culture, right? Is like I think that as an individual entrepreneur or a small team of entrepreneurs, I can know my customer better in the in the short term than than Bath and Bed, you know, Bath and Body Works can, right? Like classic example, BMW, who's a massively financed company, somebody thought it was a good idea to roll out that subscription. And and in the end, maybe people will buy that and maybe their revenue numbers will go up. I'm highly skeptical of that, especially with all the blowback they've gotten. But again, you see big companies. Uh, who was it that released that, you know, streaming service like uh, CNN Plus or something like that a couple months ago, right? Was it CNN Plus or was it? Uh, yeah, it was CNN Plus. That, yeah, that like made it like three days, right? So. There are companies with billions of dollars that are trying to figure this stuff out, and they're and they're often the reason I you know you ask advice at the beginning is but they're missing one key point: is somebody actually asking for this, or is somebody interested in the experience that you could then potentially sell to? So again, with the candle example, yes, you could go anywhere to buy a candle. Who's selling a subscription right now for Sense of the World? I, 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 I could, we could Google right now and see if there's one out there. But if there's a candle where every month you get it from, you know, you get one from uh, uh, Turkey this month and next month is Paris and Germany and like all these different scents from these different places all over the world. Like, I, you know, and maybe you don't do it every month. Maybe you do it every three months because you think about like what's where scale comes in, right? Like, OK, every three months I'm going to send three candles. Um, you know, scenting and creating them myself or with a local manufacturer is not that complicated. It's a little expensive. And my acquisition, you know, you start to think about I'm, I'm trying to market to this type of persona. Um, you can start getting going. And then and then again, this is where I come back to that data gathering is like, you know, my assumption is that people want a different scent in their home every month, but it might just be that they just like these three cents. And so that's just what I sell. I, every month, I'm just going to send you the same three cents. I'm not going to get super fancy with it because people like these and yeah. they go through them regularly, you know? It, so, so I think it's just really about getting in there and trying it and testing it. Cause you can move faster than these big companies. You can learn faster. You can learn more. You can turn that around. You know what I mean? It's different at scale. It's a lot in some ways it's harder at scale because you have to go through and change so many things and it's so expensive. Yeah. More approvals. That's the real thing. Is this yep. getting one another human to like, sign off on it? Whereas if it's two people, it's like, all right, done, <laughs> and then you make the yep, change, send right? It out. Send it yeah. out. We're, we're yep. good, you know. And I think the difference is between thinking about Starbucks and bulletproof coffee, you know, or the coffee I had pure, right. pure shrooms that I'm subscribed to. It's, it's knowing that people want coffee just to subscribe to something that would make them focus or something that's like Starbucks where they have, how do you pronounce it? How do you pronounce the Kenyan coffee? Is it Arabica or Arabica or whatever coffee? You know, Arabica. Like, Arabica, thank you, thank you. Yeah. you see, I, I'm showing my coffee ignorance here. You know what I'm saying? You know, bro, I was, <laughs> did I tell you I used to be a barista, bro? Like, I am really? a coffee. Yeah, man, I used to be a barista, man. At, uh, back when I was a kid, man. So I know all the beans, bro. Like, so, uh, McDonald's actually has the best beans, right? They use uh, Arabica beans, and then you have like uh, Tim Hortons. They started slowly incorporating Arabica, but they used to use a bean called Robusta. So Robusta is like a more uh, lesser. It's seen as like a cheaper uh, coffee bean more than Arabica. Like Arabica has like a richer taste and smell, so it can like be easily blended in many different things, man. But yeah, I used to like be nice with the the cappuccino machines but i used to like you know boil that milk to the perfect temperature bro like i knew i knew i knew my way around uh you know the the coffee shop bro so i'm a man of many talents how you didn't know that eh nah i'm learning something new <laughs> I, I love that you brought up the mcdonald's example though because to me that's actually one of my favorite like a, a great business case story is mm -hmm. back not that long ago this is like 10 10 years ago McDonald's is thinking about make trying to make a move on Starbucks, right? Which anybody would tell you was is, would be stupid. Starbucks is mm -hmm. dominating, except there's a underserved persona, which is I don't want to wait in a long line and I don't need to sit there and connect to Wi-Fi. I'm trying to get coffee on my way to work and I want good coffee on my way to work. So McDonald's invests heavily in creating just good, good coffee so that people now think it's kind of, it's weird, right? You think like, Oh, I'm going to go get good coffee at McDonald's. But oh, there's a, tons of people that do that because mm -hmm. they know they're going to get that. Oh, and by the way, they happen to buy an egg McMuffin or something else, which helps just boost their profitability even more. So so yeah. there's, you're always going to see underserved populations or 
the people that want something different and you got to test it and figure out if you can make a business out of it. Most definitely. The way McDonald's came into Canada, to, specifically with coffee, I think is a great business case because they had to fight against Starbucks and Tim Hortons. And Canadians are like Tim Hortons diehards. You know, where are you from, Matthew? Okay. I'm from California and Utah. In California Western and Utah. So you, so, so you ain't seen no Tim Hortons ever in your life, have no, you? I haven't. You've nope. never seen yeah. a Timmy's? Wow, man. No, you've never out. seen a Timmy's? No. Listen. <laughs> Owen with the nickname. <laughs> the Timmy's, man. You need to try like a, a honey crueler, bro. Like that thing yeah. will change your life. Damn. All right. Most yeah, definitely. Right. It's, a, it's a donut. Yeah. yeah. T- Timmy's, Timmy's is, yeah, is, is, is the, the Dunkin' Donuts over here, you know? Mm-hmm. And what they did, I don't know if you noticed, but McDonald's had free coffee. I don't know if they do that in the States, but they had free coffee just giving it out every day for like months to compete. That's how like Jeez. crazy they were. Yeah. So they used to give out small coffees. Yeah. I, oh, I didn't know you know this. Every day, because cause in order to compete with Tim Hortons, Tim Hortons would, used to have this thing where you could roll up the rim and get a free coffee, like a contest type of thing, right? So wow. okay. in order to compete, McDonald's like this. that idea is so good that you might as well just give free coffee in order to compete mm-hmm. and to get people to buy into the coffee. It was like business war low key, kind of like Amazon versus that yeah. diapers brand, you know? Mm-hmm. So it was an interesting <laughs> ca- ca- case study of like how they tried to like this enter the market at any case. But now I want to pivot a bit because you're in marketing and growth. I could tell you, like I looked at your, your, right. your profile and I could tell that you've been in marketing for a while. When it comes to marketing subscription businesses, you know, I know you asked what people usually get wrong overall in the subscription business, but when it comes to marketing, what are some of the things people can um, use to have a better marketing, you know, operation when it comes to, you know, running a subscription business? Yeah. First thing is uh, community. So if you think about you're starting a company, you're trying to figure out a business model, you can go out there and either look for a community to, to try to sell to, or you can try to build your own community. So let's just go with the, the candle one, right? Like, are there Facebook groups that are about candles? If so, you could probably get quite a few of those members to like try yours for free, right? To get feedback, right? If there's not a candle group on Facebook, you could start one and start posting on Reddit and other places and trying to interact with people about getting people to try your candles for free or you know, you wanted a support group of people who have a horrible smelling house, right? Like, really, that's 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 where you go. And, and the reason the community can be so useful is a couple of reasons. One, you can actually set the foundation for your first round of sales, your first round of customers. All it takes is 100 people that are buying your product on a consistent basis to, like, you start to see a little bit of growth. and get. Then you're going to get data. You're going to get feedback. You're going to create, like, loyalists that are going to start telling and sharing about your brand. And you can kind of go all in on that. Even with just a couple hundred people, you can go all in on that. So that's from a starting point. The irony is that's also that a really big key at, for larger brands is that you're starting to create this feeling of, like, community. Like, Alex, I don't know if you talk to other people that take Mushroom Coffee for Focus, but I would imagine if you met somebody else that's using that, you'd probably be talking a lot about the product and how it's different and what you're getting out of it. It's be really, really interesting to you because you're testing that. It's going to be really, really interesting to somebody else in another boat, right? So as a brand, you want to try to, like, foster some of that engagement, right? So, again, Facebook groups is the most basic way. There's a lot of different ways to, like, get at communities uh, doing that kind of thing. But you want to be able to get people to start connecting. They start to look to you from a brand experience. You're offering more than just mushroom coffee. Maybe it's, uh, you know, you have a YouTube channel on focus trip, focus tips mm-hmm. or, mm-hmm. you know, things like that. Because you know that your, your, your customer is really worried about focus, about hustle or something like that, right? So thinking about other ways you can play with them with content, that's the next step of, out of that. Um, so like with, for me, like I'm, I work with subscription businesses. A lot of my content is related to scaling your subscription business. So I'm trying to give people like free information. I have a newsletter trying to grow that subscriber base because more and more people, if they look to me as a resource for subscriptions, they're going to ultimately are going to buy our software. And if not, at least that we're going to be friends and network and, and referrals. Right. So I think that's one of the biggest things I would look at from, from a scale standpoint. Um, The other thing, like, without getting in too deep into, like, paid and some of those stuff is, like, I would always caution anybody's thinking about launching ads is what data points are you going off of, right? Like, again, mushroom coffee, what am I going to market? I see ads for mushroom coffee, and I just see an ad about a guy who's like, this is why I use it. 
and he explains it. And the person who's talking on that ad is he's explaining it in a way that's kind of compelling, personalized. And I'm assuming that's based off of data or information they've gotten from their customer base because that's who they've been selling to successfully, right? So you want to be able to gather that kind of data, those reasons, because we, again, coming back to, we always go into a business with an assumption. How are we proving that assumption? So like QPilot for a long time, we thought it would be really important to sell to people that thought it was really easy. We can give you this really great subscription experience and it's really easy to, to implement. So we thought that's a great selling point, right? It makes sense. It's really, you can have this profound subscription experience. It's easy to implement. Well, it kind of was like, eh, it didn't necessarily resonate super well, but we're seeing a lot of traction with people that actually want a subscription partner. Like they're looking for somebody to not just be a technology provider, but also give them feedback on what their program should be. Like, so that's where we're shifting a little bit of our selling because now we're getting feedback from people that are like, oh, well, no, I want a partner that's going to help me, going to give me more data, give me some recommendations, things like that. So that's that's the kind of thing you got to figure out in your business is, is, is my advice. You know, when you launch that business, I find like there might be like a grace period where, you know, I'm a new subscriber or service. You being in the industry, do you see like a trend where, you know, customers or people who are using a product give a business like a grace period of like, you know what, I'm going to try you out. And if it doesn't work, I'm going to leave. Right. What's your advice to those businesses to really like hone in in that first time that someone subscribes? Like what kind of emails <laughs> should you have? You know, what yeah. kind of like things to make them feel secure in the subscription because they're committing yeah. to you. How do you like hone in the, that first two months so they don't churn? Yeah, that's a great, great, great question. So first of all, you got to have your product dialed, right? So if we're selling mushroom coffee or, or candles, they better be good, right? Like you better have the product itself deliver on what people are assuming it's going to be. But the other thing is I, I would look at if um, if you're doing the subscription focused business, then it's it's the same workflow. But if you're doing like one time purchases versus subscriptions, you might want to look at getting a dedicated onboarding series for a subscription. So what I mean is somebody subscribe and saves to your product. They're going to be a specific email flow. And that onboarding email is basically explaining like how you can manage your subscription so you want people to understand that if they want to change anything or cancel anything, they have total control. So they don't need to worry about it. Let them know they're going to get notified when the next one comes. So you don't have to worry about forgetting. You're going to see an email or a text so you can change that order. But I would always, always double down on the reason why people buy in the first place. So again, with this, with the mushroom coffee, it's like, you know, your, your next stage of focus is on the way. Like you're, you're, you're going to love the experience and how focused you feel and how connected you feel while you're using this coffee. You're going to, you're promising that they're going to get that. They get the product. You then remind them again, getting the product that they've gotten that, whether it's with an insert or part of that unboxing experience, like any e-commerce brand, you want that to be included in subscriptions. And then this, and then when the next order is about to process and they're getting that notified, you're doing that again. Like, Hey, how has that month of focus been? Because you've got another one coming. You know, like those are the types of things we want to be thinking about every touch, creating those touch points without overwhelming people of reminding them of the benefits of the subscription. And then also subtly putting in there that they do have control if they want to change anything. I always say, like, you want to look at people of, uh, you know, if somebody doesn't you don't want to rem remind somebody they can cancel. You want to remind somebody they can they can pause or postpone their order really easily, right? Because mm -hmm. you don't want to suggest canceling because that actually has been tied data that people will just cancel. But if you do say like, hey, if you got too much product, if you got too much product, go in and pause your order or, or postpone your order is, is probably a better option, right? Oh, you've got too much coffee on hand. It's okay, like skip this month. And then that way that, that person is kind of get used to that idea of like, oh, I have that control, that experience. I always hated businesses that say cancel any time, cancel any time. I'm like, why do you already put that in my head even before <laughs> me even like, yeah. you know, buying into your business, right? It just signals like desperation to me, right? Like, let me hook you in a subscription and then make it hard for you to cancel. Like in some businesses make it so hard to cancel. Like that's why I'm so hesitant to like subscribe to businesses such as like HelloFresh, all these like food delivery businesses where 
you know, I've seen my sisters, they have boxes of food that they can't even eat. Like, they're like, bro, like, can you just take my, my Hello Fresh box, man? I'm like, I, I, I have too much food. And then I'm like, just cancel. I'm like, man, I tried so many times, but I'm trapped. I'm like, but they still enjoy the box, like, at the same time, because they, like, she's a nurse, right? So she just wants to come home, make something. Uh, but yeah, man, you bring up a great point with that. Like, that cancel any time. I just feel like it reeks of, let me just trap you in and uh, make it hard for you to come out. And Alex, you've also said this too, man. You've had issues canceling those type of food businesses, eh? Oh, yeah, for sure. Like, good food? Yo, good food get, get was giving me scam, like, <laughs> scam level, like, cancellation loopholes where they're making you go above and beyond. Like, oh, we can't cancel on on your mobile. You got to cancel on your desktop. You know, like, all types of things. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, this is a reality. You know what I'm saying? That's like, wild. Yeah. That is wild. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure, for sure. They're, so they're changing. Like, like California is passing a law where they're they're making it so it's like one one step to the cancellation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I think other steps, like I think in Europe, like it's it's harder. To, uh, you have to be more strict on making it easy. So there's like some innovation that still needs to catch up with that. And again, that's where I come back to that gym membership thing. Like I had a gym membership. I tried to cancel. I had to call. I had to call in. I had to talk to somebody on the phone. You know, like I was still going to get charged for the next like 30 or 60 days. Like, you know, like all that stuff. And you're just like, oh, my goodness. Like, why is this so hard? Yeah, Yeah, most definitely, man. Yeah. So, you know, we haven't really got into Qpilot. Could you walk us through what Qpilot is and how it serves product subscription businesses? Yeah, definitely. So um, I I think there's a lot of software out there that's been built from a billing perspective. Like they want to be really effective at like taking credit card payments. And while Qpilot is good at that, we're built from a kind of a customer experience standpoint so that people have total control. So if they want to change the product, they want to change the schedule, they can do all of those things. Um, we basically sit on the customer's website on our on our brand's websites and with under there like you just say they my my account button there's now a scheduled orders or subscription option and that way customers can go through there and manage everything about that and once that what ends up happening is if you're unless you're running an e-commerce business you don't realize maybe some of the complications around shipping and inventory management and we make that stuff really really easy on the business side the consumer doesn't have any clue that that's going on but in order to make it so that on a subscription order, I can swap out what type of coffee I want, or I can go from ordering one bag to five bags, and then shipping is going to revalidate, and only products that are available to be sold can be added, and the schedule can be managed that way. Qpilot makes that really easy. Mm. Yeah, let's talk about logistics for a minute, because I think that's something that a lot of entrepreneurs get like confused about um, and, and face yeah. challenges. What have you seen uh, as a consistent barrier and what are some of the solutions? Yeah, I think a really common one is, is has to do with shipping. And so like what might be kind of like interesting for maybe a lot of the listeners is um, I know that one of the big pushes in e-commerce for a long time is related to, you know, you have to have free shipping be the option. And actually the trend that um, that we're seeing and that I've seen, I have a logistics background as well. That's actually what kind of got me into subscriptions in the first place is there's actually this option now of where because of COVID and other things that people are starting to become a little bit more, um, you know, they understand how shipping works just a little bit better. And so one of the things that they're doing now is, is actually having two shipping options at checkout. So instead of there just being a free shipping option, you have a slow free shipping option and you have a fast or paid option and that that actually will boost conversions uh, because people feel like they have a little bit of control and they'll actually think whether they need it quickly or not and and even though we want to remove friction it, it, they're willing to pay let pay it for free or not so and the reason this is powerful is like if i'm selling dog food and i'm going to buy a new thing i already know if i'm about to be out or not and if you're telling me it's free shipping and I get it in a week, okay, cool. But if I need it like in two days because I'm going to run out and if I don't get it, I'm going to have to go, go go to PetSmart or my local place and buy it. I'm willing to pay the 10 bucks to get it expedited here a little bit faster or the $15. So so that's, that's an option too is like you no longer have to just think I just have to eat shipping costs. I can actually create an option 
where there's a free option and a paid option. The free option is slow. The paid option is a little bit faster. That actually improves customer experience because they feel like they're getting more control and they're going to get it when they want it. And, and the example I'll always use is like an Amazon, you know, next day prime is great. But I, if, you know, if I'm, it's a ream of, pa- of paper for my printer, I don't need it next day. I've already got, like, I've already got paper. I'm just trying to get paper. So when I run out, I'll have more. And we want to be able to cater to people where they're at, meet people where they're at. Um, so that's one thing. Um, the other thing that we're seeing in logistics spaces, and, and anybody's dealing with this is going to know this, is the amount of time to get product can take a long time. And so you want to be careful about when you're thinking about a subscription model is that are you reserving product? Like if I know that my shipment from China is going to be six months before I get here, I need to make sure I have enough product on hand for my next six months worth of subscriptions. Because if I sell out to a subscriber in exchange for acquiring a new customer, I'm, I'm upending the profitability model, right? Like I'm paying a Facebook ad $40, $50 acquisition cost to get a new customer, and then I'm running out of product for my subscriber that I already acquired. That's pure profit. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you got to be able to make sure that you're reserving product based on what you're going to get it back in for your subscribers so you don't run out. How are you acquiring customers right now? Like, uh, we do a myriad of ways. We d- yeah, we do direct outreach. We do a little bit with paid ads, and then we do a lot with community building and content. So, um, you know, I have a subscription prescription newsletter that I put out every week. Um, so I'm active on LinkedIn and Twitter talking about that as well as e-commerce in general. Um, and then, like, yeah, that advice around community, it doesn't just apply to D2C brands. It applies for B2B companies as well, building a community. Most definitely building community and does Qpilot does it work on Shopify uh, we will soon we've been on WooCommerce for the last few years and then our Shopify uh, we're in will be beta will be launched in just the next month or two month or two okay okay cool good to, good to know because a lot of our, our audience are Shopify entrepreneurs you know um, so yeah let us know when, when it's live man that would that'll, that'll be very yeah, we'll interesting to, to you know share, share. so um, moving on and working towards wrapping up you know is there anything that you consistently see that we haven't mentioned that would be of value to our audience? Um, I think that the, the, the other thing that comes up a lot is is in one thing that I maybe you know anybody who follows me at all probably hears about way too much is uh, you know average thinking about our average subscription life cycle. Um, the, the when we're looking at data around how long our subscriptions, how long people stay active on a subscription. Uh, Keep in mind that it's an average, and averages can be really misleading. Um, I was working with a brand the other day that said their uh, average subscription was three months. And so they were thinking that they needed to try to trigger somebody at the three-month mark to keep them around longer. But their biggest drop-off point was in month two. And so if you have to get a little bit deeper behind the average and start looking at um, – how many people are staying on month one, month two, month three, month four, month five. And when I'm seeing the biggest percentage drop month over month, that's the month I need to be looking at. Why are people leaving then? Are they tired? Do I need to give them a discount or a gift? So that's the one thing I'd say. If you just want to go a little bit deeper into understanding like your subscribers and churn, you want to just go a little bit past the average and start seeing what your most common drop off points. Again, the most common one is month one. Like, I say month zero. Most people will get a subscribe and save where somebody subscribes because they want to get the discount on that initial purchase and then they cancel. That's the most common drop off point. And there's a lot you could do there, but I wouldn't worry so much about that as much as thinking about, okay, when's the next point where I lose people the most? And can I get more data around that as well as can I incentivize people to stay around longer? So how are you usually communicating with them? Is it through text? Is it through email? Yeah, so like again, there's cancellation pop-ups to try to get, gather information, um, customer support emails, because even though you might make it easy for somebody to cancel on their own, you're often going to get emails from people that want to cancel. And then depending on scale, um, I would be calling people as well. So there's a lot of tools you can use around that where you can reach out directly to a customer to ask them if they're willing to take a survey and get a free product or a gift. Um, you, you know, every brand is a little bit different. Um, again, that's one of the reasons why I also emphasize that community piece, because if you're selling into a community, you can go to that community for feedback. Why do you guys think that the candle subscription burns out after three months? Forgive the pun. Why, why is it done? 
is, is people just don't want candles anymore or do they get tired? You know, those types of things. So um, it's not, it's, it's hard to do. It's easier said than done. Um, there are some automation you can build in, like I said, with the pop-ups and surveys. But a lot of times that is end up being like you have to find ways to glean anecdotal data or data from, from them of what they are liking or not liking. Yeah. Also, like, you know, it's it's great to talk about subscriptions and like, you know, it's a great business model, recurring revenue, like customers love your product. But we can glee, like, you know, glance over the accounting aspect of subscription models. Right. Like you got cancellations, right. you got free trials, um, you know, you got like uplifts on certain subscriptions. after Tons like of some discounts. Time. Tons of discounts. Right. And it can become messy as like a you know, novice coming into like the, into the space. So how do you manage your accounting process, especially as a subscription based business? Like does Q pilot support that? Um, what are some best practices like when analyzing your business with those type of things? Uh, share some more insight into that. Yeah. So, I mean, depending on your scale, like you definitely need to be using QuickBooks or another kind of accounting software to be tracking like transactions and things like that. So that's like number one. And so QPilot isn't going to necessarily get too involved in that. Um, however, I think like a couple of things I would always emphasize is from a unit economic standpoint, if you can't afford somebody to buy the first month with the subscription discount, like that can be scary. So for example, if my product is 30 bucks and I'm using a 20% discount and I can, and I'm not going to reach profitability until month three, that's dangerous. The price needs to be higher or the discount needs to be less. Because again, the most common place that people cancel is month zero before the renewal, first renewal happens. So you're going to get people that are going to come and get that discount and leave. So you have to be be paying attention to that. And then discounts can be complicated with coupons. So there's a lot of what different ways to track that, whether you're using Excel, um, there's some within Shopify, you can track a little bit of how the discounting like coupons are being applied and being used. Um, what makes it harder is uh, depending on when they're using it and how they're using it could alter their LTV. So that actually is ends up being pretty complicated. <laughs> um, so I would always say, try to keep that as simple as you can. Um, and then uh, for me, it's always comes down to baseline. So um, if somebody's launching a new subscription business, either looking at what discounts are already in your space or starting with like 10% and just go from there and see how things go. And then you can start just running some simple A-B tests for a week and can I do 20% off to see if that boosts conversions or not, right? I in month that three, yeah. yeah. Sorry to cut you off my it's, like, it's nothing, it, eh? It's nothing. I'm like, I hate that 10%. Yeah. Like, I hate when they offer that to me. Give me 20 or nothing. 20 or nothing. Like, actually, you know show, me, show me you care. Well, so, show me you care about me. <laughs> but see, that's the thing is, though, is like, is Alex the typical consumer for that brand? Maybe. Maybe you do 10% and you don't get anything and you got to bump it to 20 and then they start rolling in. But I would always say this, a great product, a great, like, consumer experience if people love it and you can make the point that they want to have this regularly, the 10% should be enough to at least get started. So, but again, yeah. you got to pick your baseline. Like I was working with a brand there in the CBD space. They're like, everybody says 30%. So they've got to do 30%. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, mm -hmm. like, cool. You got to do 30%. Otherwise people aren't going to pay attention to 30%. But that now is their baseline. So if they want to run extra specials, and then the way you're doing coupon management on your back end, you want to make sure that the coupons either either you're comfortable with coupons overlapping or your coupon or you're not comfortable with it. If you don't mm -hmm. let coupons overlap, people can get a little upset. But you know you don't want to do a 50% off sale and then everybody takes the 50% off coupon and they go on to a subscription that's already 30% off and then now they're getting this massive discount and your business is eating it. So that's the part yeah. where I'd say you got to be careful about managing that. The, the data on the back end on seeing uh, like what the LTV might be or not or what your costs and expenses are can be a little bit tricky. But, um, yeah, just be careful on how you're managing offers and coupons. Uh, Matt, I know like we're running up here on time. Um, that leads me to my next thing about customer service and how it defers from like a regular business. So like the, rec the revenue recovery process is a little bit different from, let's say, right. a a regular, you know, let's say I'm selling this like shaker bottle, right? Like, okay, return the bottle or whatever. But, you know, you can have someone's credit card not being able to charge. And then from like a customer service perspective, it's like, should I still keep sending them the product? Um, how do I notify the customer? How do I know when to cancel their, you know, their subscription? Yeah, so and like, 
you know, cancel the service from? And like, what are your best practices for that? Yeah, the best practice is, especially for Shopify users, is that there's actually apps that will manage a, a ton of that for you. So like um, that we'll see that a, we call it involuntary churn so that somebody's card is no longer valid and so that they're like basically not getting the order. The order shouldn't process. You shouldn't send them something. But you should have an outreach process for that. Um, there's like automated processes where they'll see that the credit card ex expiration is coming up and they'll notify them to update that. Uh, then there's another process when the order fails because of that. There's an outreach process that's automated via email or text. And then ultimately there's manual calling, like you have your customer service team call. Because that actually, like a customer, a credit card failing because of the expiration date is gone, is like 70% of the time people actually still want their subscription, right? They're not like, like the recovery on that is super high. So you automate some of it and then do some of it manually. Um, and then there's just, you think about nurture flows. I think it's depending on your size, if you can segment based off of reasons why people canceled, like the most, again, one of the most common reasons is I have too much product. Well, that person needs to be in a workflow where a month from now or two months from now or three months from now, they're getting that outreach on, hey, like you, you canceled because you had too much. Like, how are you doing now? Would you like to start that again? You know, if they cancel because they don't like your product or they said that it tasted bad or something like that, then, you know, maybe they don't get put into a, uh, a win back campaign. Most definitely. Yeah, most definitely, man. Where do you see subscriptions going in the future? Yeah, uh, I think that it, it, two things that um, I think that subscriptions are going to catch up to the shopping cart. And what I mean by that is right now, like if you're on a Shopify site, you're checking out like there's all this experience around like picking your shipping and your products and there's upsells and there's all this like control for the end user, right? Like Amazon is innovating a lot of this and I th and subscriptions are kind of lagging. It's like this customer portal and sometimes you can change something and sometimes you can't. So first I, th I see the subscription technology is catching up to the shopping cart in the sense of like there's all this control and there's all this visibility because like right now the most common subscription is you actually don't see a shipping date you don't see a delivery date. You see like the date it's going to process and maybe go out the door. So like if I'm shipping from, you know, Kansas to Toronto, like uh, do I know when that's actually going to arrive? Usually you don't. But with the Shopify like apps, like with apps like Shipper HQ and stuff like that, you can see delivery expectations. So that's happening in subscription as well. So it's no longer more about, oh, I'm just going to get it when I get it. I'm going to actually be able to see when I get it. And so um, I think a lot of that's, innovating it's, it's happening right now and that's some of the things that cute pilot is involved in developing but i think like the next stage is like the removing thought from the repurchase process so you know i mentioned like i have a hot tub we're getting supplies like you know the internet of things my hot tub orders its own supplies on a subscription on a recurring basis based off of usage and like temperature and chemicals and things like that um, and if I and if I need to go in there to manually override or change something, it's really easy to do. So I think that that's kind of like the future of where we're seeing replenishment. Amazon has this thing, and there's other startups too with coffee specifically. You just put your bag on the scale, and it calculates how much you have left and when you need a subscription to fire so that you get coffee back before you run out. That way you never have – you never need to worry about having too much on hand. So that's kind of where that future is more engagement on that repeat purchase process so that people don't have to think about it. They don't have to shop. Mm -hmm. They just know they're going to get what they get or they're going to get it when they need it. And either they're figuring that out or a machine is figuring it out for them. Um, why Why do you think Shopify hasn't been able to integrate like the subscription like model into their themes, into their website and everything? It seems like when you look at Shopify, it's like any everything that exists within there's like, hey, you got to get that app for it. You got to do whatever. Like why are they so slow to like actually supporting this type of business in your opinion well i think one of shopify's strengths though is like the app ecosystem so like they don't there's so many things that you could make that argument about and shopify has decided that they're going to be really really t 
tough on payments. They want to own the payment process because that's where a lot of the money is. And they're trying to make it really, really easy for people to develop and build out. So they're making the platform robust that way. So right now within Shopify itself, you have Recharge, who's been around for forever with subscriptions and bold subscriptions, another Canada company. Um, they're doing a lot of great stuff there. And then you have all these other apps that are innovating. Uh, Skio, Retection, uh, Atomic, um, QPilot will be there soon. There's so many people that are just taking a different stance on it. So I think that there's actually a lot of benefit in providing uh, that kind of competition. But yeah, there is always this thought that Shopify might roll out a default subscription option. Um, I don't know how sophisticated it would be at first. So like most businesses, if you're just getting started, it might make sense. But for larger brands selling on Shopify, they're going to need more sophistication. They're going to need better access to data, more triggers, more more customization to match the experience they're going for. And in those cases, that's why like the recharges of the world will will always be around. No, most definitely. Um, speaking of which, like, what are some of the apps like that you consistently see your clients use that's been like a game changer for them? You know, as we are on the the topic of apps. Yeah, so of course you're gonna put me on the spot. So let me. <laughs> um, the I'm trying to think of because I always get the butter churn, churn buster. Sorry. So churn buster is the one I was kind of mentioning that has to be a go, that it has to be a go to. So that's the one that you're gonna use that's gonna eliminate involuntary churn. Um, and then from the app space itself, um, I know that a lot of people are really successful with recharge. Um, that's a really big one. But there are a couple other options I would check out. Um, like I mentioned, Atomic, um, uh, Appstool, Skio. There's a few others to look at. It just kind of depends. I always suggest from the actual subscription app itself that you make sure you understand clearly your use case so that when you see a demo of what works. Like if you're really worried about Portal, you have to maybe look at somebody other you know you have to be really specific about who you're looking at but churn is another one to look at um, and then it's all comes up down to marketing like if you're using Clavio or other um, products where you can leverage segmentation you can create audiences with them for those win back campaigns or onboarding campaigns are really critical well, most definitely there was some big gems there so hopefully some of y'all got something that you can use for your business um, working towards wrapping up where can people find you yeah, definitely connect with me on LinkedIn, Matthew Holman, um, on Twitter as a subs- the subscri- um, subscription doc. Um, I've got a newsletter and would love to share that with anybody who's interested. We'll definitely find that in the, uh, in, the, in the show notes in the description below. And you can subscribe to the newsletter and, uh, you know, find your Twitter profile and everything. Sounds great, guys. Lastly, very last question. What quote or phrase has impacted you in the, in the recent years? <laughs> I was actually just talking to my wife about this the other day because we were talking about trauma, you know, like like the things in life that we work through and overcome. And there's something that kind of defined me. It, it's, it's something that's kind of stuck to me for a long time. But this idea of, and this might be getting a little too, a little deep and emotional here. But <laughs> uh, you know that phrase, time heals all wounds? Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, there's this quote says that time doesn't heal all wounds, only love and forgiveness heal all wounds. So uh, mm-hmm. for myself and my journey and what I've been through, learning to love and forgive myself, learning to love and forgive others is what's unlocked like the most happiness and level of profound peace in my life. And uh, so, yeah, there you go. Nah, Jeez. I'm happy I asked that. <laughs> no, that was great. No, thank that you for deep, saying man. that. I lo- yeah. Awesome. You just debunked awesome. time debunked one of the quotes that I, I always thought you know what it's gonna get better with time bro but um i watched the recent netflix doc of manti teo you know the linebacker who played for yeah. notre dame and i just saw I, he had that yeah i haven't watched it but i've seen that it's out there yeah yeah he had the, the hoax girlfriend but he said something along right. the similar things man like you know, don't be mad at the person who did it to you but have you forgiven yourself have you right. forgiven yourself for like that mistake have you forgiven yourself for feeling like that and like once you learn to forgive right. yourself it's like time just evaporates it's just like it's like a decision a moment in time and i think you just start seeing things more clear and you kind of enter like a new stage in your life because now you've let go of that baggage and you're ready just to right. move on yep absolutely um, most definitely with that being said the house is what you can't control 
So I control your grind. I control your life. I'm Alex. Oh yeah. And I and I'm Owen Osende. Yeah, I'm Matt Holman. Thanks, guys. There you the go. holy man signing out. <laughs> <laughs> the man <manhole. laughs> <laughs> <All right. laughs> Peace, y'all. Yes. Sir.